We've heard a lot this morning about confidence, leadership, valuing ourselves, being a better us. One of the best things that anybody ever did for me um, when talking about confidence leading me was actually to say thank you. Thank you for something you've done. Thank you for being you that day, for just being yourself. This day, Vet Futures would not be here, and I genuinely mean that, without Lizzie and Sally. They have worked phenomenally hard. They worked over the weekend. I know, because I got the texts from Sally <laughs> over the weekend. They have been putting together this for us, for you, for the profession, for everybody. So in the post, before we get to the post-lunch sort of slump, if it was me, you'd all be doing some exercise, but we're not going to do that. But we're going to have a kind of round of applause for them. I'm going to do it for 20 seconds and one time. <laughs> um, right, so what are you saying? There's some fantastic tweets out there. There's some fantastic videos out there and pledges. So we've just pulled some of these together to share with you. Um, the re results of the vote we'll give to you later, and thank you everybody for sticking your stickers. So I just want to go through some of these to see what people are saying. So Stuart started the day, and here we have him. I think this is great. This is pulling together all the things that we're talking about. We are building something, something that's really exciting, and it's lovely to build it with you here, with everybody. These are people that are friends and are colleagues. It is, it's about behaviours. It's about what we do every day. Anybody who's trained a puppy and trained a three-year-old, you'll know it's about that consistent behaviour that we obviously all do as parents and dog owners. It is exciting. It's exciting for the veterinary team. It's the vet futures, it's the vet nursing futures. And as we've seen, it's the interlinking of those coming together. It's brilliant. We've got students here. We've got veterinary nurse students. We've got vet students. We've got people who work in the industry of the veterinary profession. We've got people who don't work in the industry but are really interested in what we're doing. We've got Bradley. <laughs> <coughs> but it is. It's about going together. The BVA and the RCVS have come together to do this and we're asking you to come together with us to make it happen. I thought Jess was brilliant. I was talking to her first. She's like, but I only do four-year-olds. like, that's fine. They're, they're with you. They're kind of four. Do the faces. Um, yeah, don't be afraid to tell people what your dreams are. Let them help you to realise your dreams. And remember, actually, your staff have probably got dreams out there. No matter what industry you're in in the Breton profession, your team, your staff have got dreams. Go home and ask them. Well, probably not at your home. They're probably at work. <laughs> It is about the relationships that we make and the actions from those relationships that drive our own future. But it's only us in this room that can drive it. <laughs> That's just a great picture. <laughs> you just wonder what he's going to do with those bananas. Um, yeah, and it has been everybody. It really has been everybody. People who are busy doing, trying to get a veterinary degree, trying to run a practice, everyone has come together and we genuinely are really, really grateful it wouldn't have happened without Lizzie and without Sally, but we're all grateful for everyone else. As well. And I think this, is, this was brilliant. You know, you think about it, actually, this is really, these are professional times. We need to value it, and our clients expect to pay for this. <coughs> yeah, I think that's true. And it's just supportive colleagues. So actually, when you're in with somebody who does something, it doesn't have to be out of the ordinary. Just say thank you, just support them. Yeah, and I really like that actually, and that goes for vets as well. You know, it is about us. We do sometimes have to do it for ourselves. It's not about somebody else doing it for you. Doing it in collaboration, absolutely, but don't expect it to be done for you, and that's what we want. We want to work in collaboration with everybody in this room and anyone else who wants to work with us to make this happen. Yeah, the future is bright. I think it, I think it really is. We've got our challenges. And we'll get there together. It's like the minions. <laughs> I just looked at minions. I thought this was great. Um, this really is how the one world effect of our profession 
You know, we are, we're global. We've seen that with the technology. It's not just about our border. It is about how everybody working together can make the future brighter. And this guy's watching his Twitter account in Sydney, following us. I just think that's magical. And the buzz, it is a buzz. I think it really is a buzz. That's what I'm feeling in the room. Yeah, we can do it. It is our oyster. There's a lot of people in here doing very different things, all with a veterinary degree. I think that's something that we've learned today we can really celebrate. Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I did think he was going to address him at one point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's make it happen. It is. It's bringing everybody together to share the future and to make it a better future for the profession and everything that we work for. I can't actually see these particularly well, so I'm just going to whiz through these. Um, when we came to do this project, um, and what we've heard today, sort of learning from other people, learning from what other people have done, is a good way to make sure that you can progress on that and do the right thing. Now, the, um, the USA did a, a foresight um, project a few years ago, and we wanted to learn from what they did. Obviously, they'd made no mistakes, so we wanted to learn from all the really good <laughs> stuff that they'd done and do it even better. Um, and it's really nice, actually, that Dr. Andrew McCabe, who was the executive director of the Association of American Veterinary Medical Colleges, has sent this message for us. And I think that is, it sort of feels like it's completing a circle, that they started something that we have embraced and made better. <laughs> um, and that they've sent this. So if I can get... The great American philosopher, Yogi Berra, said, the future ain't what it used to be. He also said, if you don't know where you're going, you're certain to end up somewhere else. So what does the future hold for veterinary medicine? And how can we prepare for it? My name is Andy McCabe. I'm the chief executive officer of the Association of American Veterinary Medical Colleges. And I'd like to thank you for inviting me to share a few comments with you at the Vet Futures Summit. The Vet Futures Report creates a framework for the profession to prepare for and shape its own future. With six focus areas and 34 specific recommendations, it's a comprehensive and ambitious undertaking. And cutting across all of those recommendations is the fundamental role of education. This means that veterinary medical education must prepare veterinarians for whatever might come in the future not just what we can see now. Several years ago, the AAVMC developed the Foresight Report to help us envision that future and prepare for it. The Foresight Report laid out several broad objectives, such as the need to develop areas of professional focus in order to meet the ever-changing and ever-increasing expectations of the society we serve. It also laid the foundation for the North American Veterinary Medical Education Collaborative, or NAVMEC, which became the roadmap for AAVMC and its member institutions to implement necessary changes. One thing is clear about predicting the future. Although we can be reasonably accurate in the short to medium term, we simply can't be certain about the long term. However, there is strong evidence from many different sectors that more diverse teams make better decisions. And it stands to reason that a more diverse veterinary medical profession in terms of ethnicity, socioeconomic status, gender, and many other factors will be better able to adapt to an uncertain future no matter what it brings. That's why it's especially important to focus on recruitment and admissions practices 
at the veterinary schools in order to increase the diversity of the profession. I want to congratulate the British Veterinary Association and the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons and commend you for your excellent work on the Vet Futures Report. This framework serves as an example for organized veterinary medicine around the world. Now that the plan is complete, it has to be converted into action, which is the purpose of this summit. Remember, vision without action is merely a daydream, but action without vision is a nightmare. I wish you the best of success and look forward to following your progress into the future. I think the, the action without vision as we watch um, the American elections will kind of ring in my ear. Um, you know, this is showing the global reach that we have and the influences that we have just as the British Veterinary Association and the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons and the whole veterinary profession. And when we started on this, we're part of the Federation of Veterinarians of Europe, which is a very important group and one that we will continue to strive to work with because we are better get together. But they asked us to come and talk to them about what we're doing with this Vet Futures project. And it was really pleasing that they're now taking this up to work on a project themselves of vets in Europe. And I think with that, because we've been working so closely with them and they've been so inspired what we've achieved here, it's really nice that Christopher Boho, who's the former president of FVE, um, has left us this message that I'm going to play for you now. Dear colleagues, I would like first to congratulate you for the great job you have already done with Vet Future. It is a tremendous work that is going to benefit all veterinarians of Europe and even beyond Europe. We all agree that our world is changing very quickly and even more quickly than we think. Dr. Google is already there. Nanotechnologies and connected tools are opening new doors to telemedicines and new fields of activities. We must therefore make sure that we don't miss these opportunities and that the veterinarian remains at the center of the game. In other words, or more precisely, at the interface of man, animal, and environment. That future is a very exciting project because it gives the profession a unique opportunity to sit back and think outside the box and about its own future. We must definitely be proactive in order not to let other people decide upon us. We must try to be visionary and even have dreams. If you have no dreams, you have no goals, and with no goals, you have no future. It is the duty of any professional organizations like the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons the British Veterinary Association or the Federation of Veterinarians of Europe to prepare our profession for the future in order to carry out our mission to protect animal health and welfare, public health, the environment, while preserving our mental health. That future must allow us to answer one question. Are we going to where we want to be? I know that the hard work is waiting for you. It was almost an easy task to identify challenges, but now actions have to be found and implemented. So I wish you the very best for the success of this important meeting. Make sure that your dreams come true and don't forget to remain actors of your own future for your own benefit, but also for the benefit of the next generation of veterinarians. I wish you a very good day. I think they were quite wise words at the end. We can make dreams come true. We can make actions happen for ourselves and for the next generation. 
So leading on to this afternoon's sessions, we're going to start with reflective practice. Um, and I'm really pleased to invite up here that we have um, Mary Thompson, who's been a member of the Vet Futures Action Group, um, is a veterinary surgeon in Devon, um, a, a Vet Life Board member, um, and an RCVS postgraduate dean. And also um, with Mary today, we've got uh, Dr. David Watt, who's president of the Balance Society, and Dr. Kerry Dornan, who is secretary of the Balance Society. Um, and I'll hand over to yourselves. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. I'm Mary. I've been a committed and enthusiastic general practitioner for the last 18 years. Something I've found interesting over the years is that, of course, I enjoy all aspects of my work. I enjoy working with animals, but I gain an equal job satisfaction from the connections I make with people, whether that's my clients, my local community, where I engage in outreach work, or with the excellent teams of professionals, my receptionists, my nurses, my other vets, my paraprofessionals that I work with every day. We're going to focus as part of the health and well-being topic on reflective practice today. It's something that many of us do already, but that we could, I think, sometimes be a bit better at. We'll begin with a quote, which I'd like you all to read. I think this is absolutely true. We learn from reflecting on experience. I have 18 years now of reflecting on experience in practice rather than one year repeated 18 times, I retain knowledge far better through learning from those experiences in practice. First of all, I'd just like to consider a definition of reflection fairly briefly, because I haven't got a lot of time today. So reflective practice is the process by which we stop, we think about our working practices and also about our communications. We analyse our decision-making process. We then evaluate uh, current theory. We might also consider experiences of our colleagues. And we relate that to what we do in practice. And this process of reflective practice allows us to refocus our thinking on our existing knowledge. It might allow us to perhaps generate new knowledge and ideas, and we may then make changes to our practice or to our communications. How do we reflect? Well, we can reflect internally. We might do that by just taking a few moments at the end of a busy morning. I think we all have far longer to-do lists than we ever thought possible. We could also reflect internally by writing reflective notes. We can reflect as part of a small group, perhaps one-to-one -one with a mentor in practice. We can make use of frameworks in practice for dealing with errors. We can use reflective tools. We can also reflect as a larger group from our wider profession and perhaps with colleagues from related professions. Why should we reflect? Well, there is increasing evidence that more traditional <coughs> input-based methods of learning don't necessarily result in long-term changes to practice or changes to our behaviour. And I think that really resonates where well-being is concerned because as a wider profession, if we are to have improved health and well-being of veterinary professionals, behavioural change is what we need. So we should reflect because it's good for our well-being. It allows us to deal more effectively with uncertainties. It makes us better problem solvers. If we use frameworks for dealing with errors in the workplace, we can um, we can sort of reduce the blame culture that can happen within the profession and that can in turn reduce stress and anxiety. And I think 
certainly in my experience as a group of people, we tend to be quite good at beating ourselves up, um, at being quite self-critical. As Jess mentioned this morning, we tend to be perfectionists. Reflective practice can encourage a degree of self-compassion, which can allow us to be more resilient in our work and hopefully to, to manage to remain in practice. And then just finally, before I hand over to Kerry, what do we reflect on? Well, we are a group of fairly analytical individuals. We're good at problem solving. I would hope that in terms <coughs> of the process of reflecting on clinical scenarios, we should, with the work of the Mind Matters Initiative and the Society of Practicing Veterinary Surgeons, we should hopefully be able to encourage widespread use of reflective tools and error frameworks within practices. But what we must not forget, and what certainly rings true for me with my interest in working with people, is that we should also reflect on our communications and our emotional interactions with others. And keeping that in mind, I'd like to now hand over to Dr. Kerry Dornan to talk a little bit about the Balance Society. So, um, I'd like to thank Mary very much for inviting David and myself along here. We're actually doctors of people. <laughs> we're both, um, well, we're actually retired, but we're both general practitioners from a human side. Um, and Mary approached our society initially to explore something that she'd discovered in her searches about how um, people might reflect in different professions. So we're going to try and give you a very short um, snapshot of what, what's called the Ballant Method is about, um, which is um, quite a challenge, but we'll do our best. If you want to know more about Ballant, I suggest you look on the website where you can peruse it at your pleasure. Um, so, why Ballant? Well, Michael Ballant <coughs> was a psychoanalyst. And before you all run away, um, don't, because actually he was very grounded. But he was a Hungarian psychoanalyst who came to the UK as a refugee in, the 19, uh, in 1939 and um, began working with general practitioners in the 1950s in London, really to see how he might help to support <coughs> them in their work, particularly when they were engaging in thinking about psychological aspects of their practice and what then from some research groups he ran what then came into being was what we now call Bullent groups which are a form of discussion group I'll just give you this is a very stylized basic background to Bullent um, your blue Practitioners are the blue, the blue figure, that is meant to be a person. Um, your client or pet owner is green. Um, there's the dog just to show that's a veterinary practice. And what this is really trying to say is that we, the Bolint theory is based <coughs> on the psychoanalytic view that as well as conscious communication, that we have unconscious communication. And that's the limit to which psychoanalysis will enter the rest of the conversation. But it is about the effect of when you're with another person, you might experience thoughts, you might experience emotions, and you might actually have bodily feelings. Now, some of those probably belong to you, and we can usually, although there are blind spots, we can often work out what those might be. You know, we were up late last night, we're tired, we're a bit fed up, didn't want to come to work. But there are also maybe things that we're experiencing that don't come from us. And what the Balint theory is about, really, is helping practitioners to notice and then to start being curious about things that may come into their mind or feelings that they have when they're interacting with another person. And I suppose, in particular, it's those feelings which linger. And I'll just show you, um, say you've had a... Um, an interaction with a, a pet owner and you're left with some feelings that you don't quite understand. They're a bit different. You know, you, you dealt with the same clinical problem endless times over. But there was something about this interaction that left you feeling different. And the sort of things 
that might sit with you might be just a feeling of unease. They might be sort of negative feelings. They might think, why does that person irritate me so much? Um, it might just be being puzzled. Um, it might just be the thoughts that hang around and you can't get out of your mind. And it might be those situ situations where you feel <coughs> very burdened. So what a Balink group is about, and this is, I suppose, taking it into its modern day um, method, is that you can come to a group and a balanced group would typically have um, about eight members, eight to ten members, a couple of leaders or facilitators for the group. And usually a traditional balanced group would meet from time to time, but the same group of people, so that you can build up a sense of trust and that you can bring your story and your feelings to that group. And the purpose of the task for the group is that when you, when you tell your story, as well as you <coughs> perhaps experiencing <coughs> things and thoughts and feelings, the group will start to do that when they hear the story. The story can be clinical aspects, but it also brings your experience. And the value of the group is that people will react differently. And that the presenter of the case will tell their story and usually will just sit back whilst everybody else just talks about what they think might be going on. Now, the, 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 um, it will be a little different, obviously, in, um, in our situation than yours, in that we will be more interested in aspects of the psyche of the patient, if you like, you know, something more about them because they're the person we're actually treating. In your situation, it may be more about understanding things about that person when they come to see you presenting their animal. So there are parallels, but not, not quite the same um, sort of... You wouldn't necessarily be wanting to think in great depth about the, um, what's going on in the, in the mind of the patient. But it's more about the experience of being with that person and trying to understand what that might be about. Because that could, then can help you to be more therapeutic in your interaction with that person. So I, I'll just let you read this, but this, this was obviously Michael Ballant referring to, um, to doctor-patient relationships in our sense. Um, I'll just give you a minute to read it. So unlike some types of discussion, what the presenter wants is to go away with some ideas. They're not, if I go on to this, to say what a balanced group is not. It's not, people are not coming for advice. They're not looking for a solution to their problem. And they're not there to be taught. And they're also not there to analyse the presenter. It's not about what's going on in the presenter's internal world. They may have thoughts about that as a result of the discussion, but it's not for the group to probe that unless the presenter wants um, to mention aspects of that. It's more about having a safe space, so you don't discuss cases outside, where you can bring sometimes quite difficult feelings and try to understand what are those about in relation to my interaction with this person. So that if I meet this person again, I can have different thoughts and also maybe just sometimes learn to separate myself off a little bit from what's going on. So I can take a bit of an emotional step back. What we want to do next is just, oh, yeah, time to um, think about a case. We thought that as a way of illustrating how a group like ours might help, that we'd go on to, um, Mary's going to talk briefly about a case that she might bring to a group like this, and then David is going to talk about how a balanced group might, discussion might help. So my case was quite a recent case from practice. I had an elderly client. Uh, he had been coming to the practice for many years. I was aware that he was on his own. His wife had died several years previously. He was very frail. His mobility was poor. He was completely reliant on neighbours or carers to bring him to the surgery. And his only companion was his 14-year-old Yorkshire Terrier. This Yorkshire Terrier was in chronic renal failure, was on a programme of dietary management, 
she was doing okay. <coughs> I thought her quality of life was still acceptable. She was losing weight, but not excessively. And then it always happens on a Friday afternoon. Friday afternoon reception, take a phone call from one of the welfare charities who had fortunately had the presence of mind to contact us first rather than going straight to the, the elderly gentleman's home. One of his carers had reported him to this welfare charity accusing him of neglect. And that left me with a, a real dilemma. So perhaps, David, if I let you comment on... Well, so, <coughs> what, so that might be the, the presenter's short story. She might say a few more things. Um, <laughs> um, but the, uh, the, as a leader of the group, I wouldn't, you, the leader doesn't tell the group what to think about. The, the group is an independent group of adult learners who can then reflect on a situation like that. Um, as a leader, you just might, I would be just looking for the group to cover uh, certain sorts of things, which would be um, the, like the, the, make sure that the group talks about the relationship between the presenter and the elderly man. Probably about the elderly man and the pet as well, because that's quite clearly of importance here. Another important thing would be for the group to acknowledge the sadness that was in the, in the case, that it was emotional for the presenter, <coughs> obviously for the old man as well. Um, to acknowledge that, for the group to probably acknowledge that the, um, that the doctor or the, the vet likes this patient a lot, that they've had a long relationship, and that that's a, vir uh, that's a virtue, that's a great thing for this man. Um, and also that, the, that the, the owner trusts this vet because of that long knowledge. Then, as, um, uh, as Mary said, external forces have come into play because someone has accused this man of, um, of uh, mistreating his pe pet. How does that make Mary feel? How does that, hopefully the group would talk about how they would feel in that position, how they'd feel very threatened, that it might question their judgment. Was I doing the right thing? Should I have been doing something differently? Um, and, of course, the same would be for the owner. But maybe you want to say what actually happened. Yes. Um, so our very experienced receptionist who took the call came to find me, had a discussion with me, at that time, we had a locum vet working for us, a very experienced locum vet. So we asked him to attend on a home visit because we felt that would be uh, an individual who's in a more impartial position. He attended on a home visit and actually agreed with my standpoint that this dog did still have adequate quality of life. And, um, you, you know, I had felt that this elderly gentleman, this dog was <coughs> so much part of his day-to-day -day routine. Mm -hmm. You know, he, in a way, he was, he was living for the dog. Um, so that, that was what happened. And actually, what we did after that perhaps illustrates the importance of the veterinary team. I didn't want to, for him to have unnecessary expense involved, but I knew that he had issues with, with getting the dog to surgery. So we arranged for our nurses to do reduced rate visits with the mobile set scales to carry out regular weight checks and to alert us if they had concerns. Mm -hmm. And hopefully the group would, um, w I would want the group to talk about this m marvelous teamwork and that the relationships with the, with the patient, but also with her own team, that the, the, this veterinary practice seems to work together, that they can manage a situation like this, that the whole practice can um, take a lot of responsibility for a patient, for an owner, and be happy to, to take that extra responsibility, to go that extra mile, to use the personal relationship. And it's about value, I think, accepting that as vets or doctors, we will, for some clients, do a little bit more, that we, and that the, there is a value in the, the relationship with an individual client. The other thing the group might do is, which we didn't hear about now, is that they might want to fantasise a bit, of, because that's one of the things in, in reflection, that you can fantasise and have ideas which may help the presenter in the longer run. So they might fantasise about how long the 
pet, how long the guys had the pet, when his, what was his relationship with his wife in the past, that sort of thing. Um, really, I think that we can leave it there. It's just about trying to open up the situation, but not find solutions. Just leave the, the, the lots of ideas in the mind of the presenter or the, the vet to think about afterwards. Thank you, okay. David. So that's been really helpful. Just very, very briefly to sum up our reflective practice slot. There are our key words as far as reflective practice is concerned. And I think the most important take-home message here is that reflective practice and reflection shouldn't just be something else on our to-do list. It should become part of who we are as practitioners and as people. <laughs> Thank you. I think the really nice thing about today is there's always something um, coming from these that we can just get something we can take home from. You know, we, we have a busy day, but sometimes we just find that tiny safe space to discuss with our team and reflect on what we're doing. I think we can really learn something. I think that's something we can all take back from today. Um, I've just got Robin very, very quickly. Just in that situation, when you reflect on the motive, so in that situation, when you reflect on the motivations of the person who made the complaint, because in practice, we often find that we get very defensive when people challenge us. Actually, sometimes some of their shoes realise why they challenge us. Yeah, I, I, I accept that. I'm sure the group would talk about that. As, as a leader, we, I might not particularly focus on that, but I'm sure the group would, would talk about that, and that would be definitely in there, yes. About why. And the other thing would be why, well, might be why the, um, a little bit about why the, the presenter liked this patient a lot, and whether everyone else did or not. And I'd just like to thank the speakers. I'm, I'm sure we could have more discussions on this, and it is something we can talk about at break, but just so we can keep the day flowing, I'd really like to thank you for taking your time out and sharing your thoughts with us. It's been very helpful. Um, animal welfare came out as pretty much the top thing that people were concerned about when we were looking at vet futures. So we were extremely pleased to produce the animal welfare strategy and launch that in February. And I think you've all got some of that in the pack, and I know a lot of you are familiar with, with that. Um, and James has been on the Veterinary Futures Action Group, tasked with looking at animal welfare. You'll all know James's pedigree on animal welfare. Um, I, I love to listen to James speak on a lot of things. But on animal welfare, I, he is somebody that I can really look up to. And I think I'm really pleased that he's speaking here today. Bigging you no up. Pressure. Bigging you up. <laughs> so without further ado, I'll hand you over to James. Thanks. Thank you very much. Good. And it's been really wonderful to be part of the group, building on uh, all this work, and to be here with you today. I'm very conscious now <laughs> of my glass of water. Uh, the good news is that wasn't my cat, uh, it was a stray cat, uh, so it may well be in time that he's looking for a home. So uh, if anyone's... Unfortunately, at the RSPCA, we go through a very rigorous series of checks to make sure... Uh... <laughs> so what we're going to do uh, today it's focused just on one of the uh, actions, one of the recommendations that was in the VET Futures report. But to frame that around, as Gudrun said, the um, BBA's animal welfare strategy, recognising this does nearly, to be honest, nearly all of the work uh, that would have fallen to me on the action group, recognising there's also, of course, bits of the profession um, not included here. And as a very quick point, that's the recommendation. Ethics, I think, to think about uh, for this session and generally as practical reasoning. It's not sort of theoretical navel-gazing, or if it is, that's not really what it's for. It's in order to improve our actions, what we do, in reality. So the reality is the various pressures, the various tensions, the various limitations that we've got. And what that, of course, means that there are controversial aspects. If we just talked about the easy bits there would be little to say. So as a starter for 10, and putting this not as a regulatory function, but as an ethical one, I've realised I've just flagged Bradley as regulatory and Sean as ethical. Bradley, I'm sure, is equally ethical uh, <laughs> as Sean. Um, but as an ethical principle, this idea that our constant endeavour uh, is to ensure the health and welfare of animals 
committed to my care. I'm sure at least UK graduates are very familiar with that phrase. So very quickly in this session, I thought let's go through what this means for those four that were in the, um, the recommendation. Uh, everyday practice, policy making, research and education. And we'll try and do this a little bit interactive. By good fortune, uh, didn't try and use turning point. Uh, so it's a show of hands. I think in the interest of time, we'll save discussions around those points generally to the <coughs> session after the break. So a first, I thought, interesting question. Given that, whether you're taking it as ethical or regulatory or a, pr a promise, how does that make you feel? So proud, uh, determined, I haven't got a series of hand actions, determined, <laughs> pressured, uh, com confused, um, or something else. And it would be interesting, having said, not to discuss, at least to hear what people say for other. So, choose one. Oh no, actually, a better idea. You can choose as many as you like. Ignore my previous instruction. <laughs> See, this, this isn't on the hoop. Proud. All oh, right, hold it, hold it. For the photo, <laughs> done. <laughs> Determined, I think we've got to achieve these. <coughs> we've got to live up to this. Okay, yeah, also, again, very strong uh, response. Pressured or stressed, this adds to our uh, difficulties of an already demanding job. Okay, so some, oh yeah, actually, then uh, some uh, late entrance to coin the phrase. Um, confused, in terms of what does this mean in practice? Uh, what does it mean generally? What's James on about? Why is he here? <laughs> yeah, smattering of those. And anyone... <laughs> oh, I realise I realize where the hands came from uh, near the end. And other. Anyone feeling something else that they would like to share that this idea makes you feel? Uh, we have some... Uh, well, I think we have a microphone, but if, it's, if you're saying something short, you can probably shout it out. We're not recording, are we? We are recording, but, in that shout. You, but if you speak loud... Shout. Shout, shout then. Let's take, go from the right forwards. I'll not say anyone's names, because I don't want to differentiate who uh, I... Uh, it's not that anyone. to be honest, in, that in this kind of job, we, that's our aim, that's our objective in this profession. It felt completely natural to say that and to do that in my everyday job. Okay. Natural. I'm repeating for the recording. <laughs> Responsible. I think a sense of responsibility which is additional to determined or depression. As in this places on you a responsibility or is this is a, uh, an articulation of a responsibility you already have or both? It's a responsibility on us okay. to act, if you like, as the spokesman for the animal in front of us. Okay. Privileged to be trusted with that responsibility. Privilege, yeah, okay, so with responsibilities come or privilege or the other way around, but they're potentially a package. Right at the back, and then we'll come forwards, I'll have to name, so Stephen and David. Good in terms of service, well. Okay. As in you feel good, like a warm glow type feeling. Yeah, okay, uh, and, uh, which is something I think we look at not enough. We, we tend to focus on some of the others. Further forwards. I don't, but I wonder if some people Explain. Where the interests of the owners of animals may be of significant impact in their decision making. Okay. So from different ethical pressures or that the <coughs> owners are putting pressure on them. Who else had hands? I only looked that far, really. Yes. Oblige. It's kind of okay. the, the core. Okay. Again, from outside that society... From outside that society <laughs> or the RCBS is obliging you... Or uh, sort of obliged as in, you know, you feel personally conscious, responsible. Almost. Okay, yeah, that makes, makes good sense. Any over that side of the room? There doesn't have to be, because uh, um, I'm conscious of time, but please, two of you have one. Okay, that was fascinating for me. Regardless of whether it was useful for anyone else, I thought that was, uh, yeah, extremely interesting, both in the distribution of that. As I say, I'll not discuss them more, except to move on to these. And this will be a bit whistle stop tour. So let's say what does this mean for everyday veterinary practice? What does this promise, this responsibility, this obligation mean? Well I guess it's acting in the best interests of each animal in the circumstances and I think the critical thing here 
is the circumstances. So what does this mean? And this might be something for the discussion uh, or outside of today. So I guess one way of framing that question is what's to stop us constantly endeavouring, etc., etc. I have I'm sure you all know it by heart, so I haven't re written that out each time. What stops us constantly uh, endeavouring to, etc., uh, etc. Et <laughs> so uh, owners <laughs> or clients, um, lack of resources, whether that's from the owner or practice uh, or resources, colleagues, pressure from colleagues laws and regulation in the sense of being told what to do, not in the sense that regulations are an articulation of our own uh, professional ethic, other, as you might have to explain, um, or nothing. Actually, you think you can achieve this all the time. Um, again, this time I think just do one, so the one you think most important. So owners or clients? Okay. Oh, okay. As uh, people thought, I think a few more coming in. Lack of resources? About similar distribution. So again, a significant uh, proportion there. Colleagues, pressure from colleagues. Okay, a couple there. Again, I won't expl uh, look into people's roles. Uh, laws and regulations, we're sort of being stopped from endeavouring somehow. Again, a bit of a, 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 a smattering, maybe half a dozen. Um, and other, something else that I've missed. Yes. Yeah, OK. So it's not a pressure from outside, it's literally knowing what is the best interest for uh, those fish. Okay. There was another hand I saw out the corner of my eye. Perfect. Mine's a slightly odd one, but it's that sort of um, feeling that you can't do anything when it's an animal that's not really in your care, but through circumstances. Mm -hmm. Like a road traffic accident where maybe your own personal safety takes priority. You know, you run part, you know, I think... I, 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 But actually, sometimes it's really difficult to do something about it, or your own personal safety might take precedence if it's on the M25. Yeah. So, but, no, 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 but uh, I think that pulls in a few. So one is what you physically can do without putting yourself in unnecessary <coughs> danger. One, perhaps, I guess, is the health and safety from a regulatory bit. But this question of animals not in your care, and I think this is a very interesting question we'll have to talk more about on some of the One Health agenda issues, is what exactly this means uh, of being under our care, what responsibilities, obligations we have outside of those animals. It's also relevant to research, which we'll very lightly touch on here. Again, we're not going to discuss these more. What I'll do purely is to highlight, having just seen my first yawn, uh, highlight <laughs> some of the solutions that um, work from this and after this. And all this is ongoing work. So really, it's about enhancing the ethical decision-making, is trying to get better through dialogue, consistent decisions, I think there is a question of placing responsibilities as a profession where they lie, so some of that is with uh, owners. And feeding on in this talk follows very well from the last talk, although with the ethics, it's, it's, as well as the reflection, it's then about your uh, action. It is about what you do next. Um, and probably from the ethical point of view, we'd, we'd draw in, um, where's Kerry, some of the issues about thinking about how animals, uh, their emotions, uh, their feelings... So what we're looking at is some uh, guidance in BVA publications. Obviously, they have a very high standard, so that has to meet that. Um, we're negotiating access for uh, vets uh, to the Animal Welfare Research Network. Bless you, primarily for researchers, um, but also, of course, clearly there's an interaction here. And uh, as you'll see in the pack, looking at RCVS rules or guidance to reframe some of these issues. The next one, in the very little time, is policy making. So I think this is about us being clear leaders and people need to know how we're setting our policy. So they, if need be, we are articulating 
these ethical tensions. And I will take a bit of time because I like this. Um, I was at a workshop and a delegate there said, well, animal welfare uh, has moved on and vets have missed the boat, was their word. And another delegate, a non-vet, said, yes, they didn't disagree, but yes, but they're in a speedboat. We have, uh, whether or not one agrees with that, we have the capacity to catch up. Uh, and I guess in the sense of forming our own destiny, uh, we have a motor rather than sails. Uh, so we're not having to tack into the wind. And I think that's where my analogy stops. <laughs> Certainly my knowledge of sailing and Julian or someone can feed in. So we do have this ability, I think, to really be leaders in this. And again, I won't discuss it, but what stops us, do we think, as a profession, having that clean leadership? What are the challenges? And that's an inappropriate phrase, actually, because we're not stopped from doing it. What is a co contrary wind? Owners, clients' wishes, tensions with them, because that can put us in difficult situations. Uh, lack of resources as a profession. You'll recognise this list. Uh, colleagues that we don't feel we've got all our colleagues in the profession with us. There's going to be a lot of others, I think. Laws or regulations? <coughs> okay. As in, it's difficult what we can and can't say. Well, things like um, human, uh, humane slaughter. You know, okay, so, right. so what we're trying to change is the laws and regulations. That makes very good sense. Um, other? Bear in mind, not many people have put hands up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, does anyone want, yeah, so say there are others. Let's start from the front. OK, that's interesting. So it's not the resourcing, it's, a, it's that confidence that we are the best. I guess that means we have to make sure we're the best. We can't merely be the best. We have to remind ourselves we are. Any other others? A society, surely, that, that looks at us and, and, and a society that maybe doesn't choose whether it be farming as particularly important within, and animals within their society. So that's a constant challenge. If the, if the people in political power don't believe mm. that this is the yeah, yeah. So that, in a way, that's who, whom we're trying to influence in the first place. Um, I'll take one at the back and then we better move on. I, I think in the context of today, we're at the start of the journey and we've only just got the map. We haven't worked out which way north is, so having to speak about time, and that's going in the wrong direction. So it's kind of, <laughs> this is the starting point for the catch up, potentially. So it's ourselves, it's us, it's the fact that futures is a nascent being, and then futures is a nascent being, and we're now lining up behind objectives. Thank you, and that's a much better use of the analogy uh, <laughs> than I ever thought of. So the solution to that, what already are we uh, looking at or thinking of doing? I think the survey that went in, uh, surveys previous to this has made it very clear, at least from BVA members, animal welfare, and we as well as particular issues, is, is so important to them. It's something we want BVA to be doing. Um, looking at uh, working with other people, obviously I've got a, an interest in this in another hat, uh, looking at how we can coordinate uh, across BVA and its specialist <coughs> divisions with um, other people who are involved in this. And, of course, the, there are good examples of that. So I guess that's a, an armada. <laughs> that's only just occurred to me uh, <laughs> to do. And then looking at our framework for policy making. This really, I think, is a, a start-out bit of work. There's obviously uh, other work to do, again, both in Europe uh, and in the UK. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip through the rest. Are people all right not putting their hands up? I got the feeling of a wane of enthusiasm uh, in the last one. So looking at the next bit in terms uh, of research, again, um, to skip those, the work being done, uh, there's, we've just started at the uh, RCBS, uh, looking at clinical research ethics panel, really to help uh, people looking to do that research. And there, there was a discussion at their sort of introductory ethics session about that still the primary thing is looking after those animals and the research is, if you like, a, an add-on. I've mentioned the Animal Welfare Network and also we're discussing novel therapies. And finally, education I won't say much about because uh, it was covered before, but clearly there's work on undergraduate curriculum, uh, bless you again, postgraduate uh, curriculum, making sure these are practical. Um, and again, I think there's, there's work, as VDS did, with communications um, and uh, really has increased the impact of that. So, all this and more.
I can only do that hand, is in this um, document. So if you haven't read it, do. And again, as we are with Vet Futures generally, think how you and your organisation uh, or you as an individual can get involved. Thank you very much. Bless you. Please do read the animal welfare strategy, do share it with colleagues, do refer to it. I think the brilliant thing in that, we actually started to term ourselves as an animal welfare focused profession and I think that's fantastic to celebrate.